another presentation today. Not that you know of, not yet. Go check your email. <laughs> you might have one. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get uh, um, on our next topic. We have uh, Tamara Jackson, Jackson Zems. You've heard here, if you've been at any of these in the past, she was here, I think, last year and maybe even the year before. I don't remember. Been here last year for sure. So uh, anyway, so we're glad to have her. She's going to come in and talk a little bit about some corn diseases and, and specifically the bacterial leaf streak. Um, it's a, a disease that came around last year, I think, right? Last couple, couple years. years anyway. So it's uh, sort of the new disease on the block. So um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to her and let her take it from there. So thank you. Thank you, Tyler. And good morning, everybody. How's the sound? Everybody can hear okay right now? So uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to come out and talk to you again. I know a lot of you are repeats from last year, and so you've heard a lot of this already. And I introduced bacterial leaf streak to you last year. But what I was really excited about is a chance to get to come out and kind of give you an update on some of the things that we've learned since then. And so for those of you who are not familiar with this disease, I'll, I'll have a little bit of material kind of bring you up to speed a little bit. So I also don't want this to be a lecture. I hope that if you think of something, you have a question, go ahead and shout it out. Let's talk about it because maybe somebody else is thinking that too. And it's just easier to talk about it in the moment, right? So don't be shy about that. I'm not offended by that at all. And so throughout these slides that I've got for you, I'm so thrilled that you get color handouts because you get to keep some of these pictures and keep them uh, handy in case you have a, a question about it because I've got a lot of pictures in here of what this disease looks like. And if you uh, weren't aware, this disease, it is bacterial. And the name of the bacterium is up here at the top, that weird X word, that's Xanthomonas vesicula pathovar vasculorum. And don't worry, I won't say that ever again. And so we, we abbreviated XVV to make it easier to talk about. But we finally reported this disease for the first time, not only in Nebraska, it was the first time in the United States in August of 2016. And so, you know, we've just gotten to hear Tom talk about some of the things out there, some of the things that may be scary because we don't know much about them. And this one was certainly a surprise. You know, I never would have expected and didn't know anything about it when we first started to see this. And so I guess um, it was about a year, about a year, year and a half before that, that we started to realize something different was out there. And so we worked with a number of different groups and colleagues in different states and eventually with the Nebraska Corn Board and others to uh, get this identified and make sure to get the message out there so that everybody knows that there's something different out there. And then we have one more thing to add to your list of things to look for and think about. And it's not just a Nebraska problem. This is a disease that's been confirmed in nine total states. And so we've got a map here in a minute, you'll get to see that. But as we go through here, make sure and look closely at the picture of the symptoms of this disease. As you might expect, it makes streaks on the leaves, and those are between the, the veins, and very narrow, and often very yellow, and so be sure and notice that. Well, one of the important things to know, and why this was such a big deal back during that time period, is that at that point, we had only confirmed this disease on corn in South Africa. And so to have it pop up in the middle of the United States was quite uh, alarming for a lot of people. Well, now, just in the last month, we know, too, that it's also been confirmed in Argentina. And so that's pretty hot off the press. And so we're going to talk about that in a little bit. What we did know about it from the very beginning, which was very little, but what we did know is that this bacterium also causes disease on sugarcane. And it had not been confirmed in the United States, though. But on sugarcane, it causes a very important disease, and it's been confirmed almost worldwide on sugarcane. It causes gumming disease. And so uh, it behaves differently on sugarcane, though, thankfully. In sugarcane, it plugs up the vascular system. It can kill plants, a lot like what Goss's wilt does. Well, in corn, we've not observed that. And so good news right now is that it's only been on the leaves thus far. And so if anything changes, we certainly will keep you up to date. Well, in South Africa, corn is not as important of a crop to them as it is to us. And so not a lot of research had been done on corn 
on this disease in South Africa. And so we didn't have very much information to go on. Definitely not good recommendations to make for management of this disease. One of the things that they had done though, is they had documented other hosts for this pathogen. And that's interesting. Now, while it may not have direct implications for us, because some of those plant species are palm, certain types of palm trees, like coconut palm, uh, certain tropical grasses, for instance. Uh, one of them that was important to us was that it does also go to several species of sorghum. To date, though, we have not confirmed this disease ever in a sorghum field in Nebraska or in Kansas or otherwise. And so um, we have to keep in mind that this work had been done in the greenhouse. That's where we do a lot of that host range testing. And the greenhouse is not always a good predictor of what will happen out in the real world, out in the field, but that's a starting point. And so uh, we've shown that it, our bacteria goes to sorghum too, and the related species like Johnson grass and shatter cane and sedan grass. But uh, at this point, nope, we haven't seen that out there, so we don't know how important that is. The thing that I think is more important is that the symptoms that this, this disease causes looks a lot like a disease that we already have, and that's the fungal disease gray leaf spot. And indeed, very early on, that's how many people found out they had a problem that was different, is that they thought they had uh, gray leaf spots showing up early, on those lower leaves and they started spraying fungicides. Well, fungicides don't work on this pathogen because it's bacterial. And so I know a lot of you are flipping. So what happened was I wanted to share a lot more slides with you than I knew I'd have time. So you have a lot more information there that you'll be able to look through when you have time. And so if you have questions, get back to me, but I probably will skip around a little bit. And so you'll have those resources available to your, to your, uh, for your use then. But when you look at this disease, and when it looks, especially like it does on this leaf on the slide, looks pretty bad, that looks like really severe gray leaf spot. And so I can see where somebody would want to call the airplane and get the fungicide out there. But that's not going to control this disease. And so learning how to diagnose it is going to be a really important part of this. And so in this table, I tried to summarize some really uh, important characteristics of the two diseases side by side, so that it'll hopefully help you and uh, help you get to the right diagnosis. And so on the left-hand side, it's just the things that we're talking about, the, the causal agent, the disease, when we see it develop, what favorable weather, and the overall appearance of the lesions that they cause. Well, at the top, this middle column is bacterial leaf streak, then the third column is gray leaf spot. And of course, one's bacterial and one is fungal. Well, fungicides do a really good job controlling fungal diseases like gray leaf spot and southern rust, but they don't control bacterial diseases like this. And one of the big differences that I think is probably the biggest clue that you may see something different. You know, this bacterial leaf streak, it acts like gray leaf spot. It looks a lot like gray leaf spot because it starts on the lower leaves usually and works its way up the plant. Well, that's what gray leaf spot does, and that's part of the trickery that was here. Well, one thing that was very different is that we often see bacterial leaf streak start much earlier in the season than you'll ever see gray leaf spot. And that's because the bacteria causing bacterial leaf streak likes or at least tolerates cooler weather conditions. Well, the fungus causing gray leaf spot, it needs that warm, humid weather. And normally we see that weather maybe not until July. And so by July 4th or after that, mid-July, that's why we tend to see gray leaf spot during that time of the season. And so if you start seeing something on those lower leaves that looks like uh, streaks or rectangles, that's probably something different because this bacterium, uh, we've confirmed it in corn as early as V4. That's little four-leaf corn. In the greenhouse, we can, we can make this happen as early as emergence when that first little spike comes up out of the ground. And so that's just under very favorable weather conditions, wet, high humidity. And so my point is, is that bacterial leaf streak can occur at any point throughout the season, unlike we, we see with the other diseases. Now the next part is going to mean you got to take a closer look at the lesions. 
and really start to split hairs and pay close attention because the lesions themselves might look a little bit different. And so in particular, the edges of the lesions, the margins, where gray leaf spot produces a pretty typical rectangular lesion. It has smooth edges, smooth margins, kind of linear. Often the ends of the lesions are capped, almost uh, squared off. Well, in contrast, bacterial leaf streak causes wavy, irregular edges on the lesions. That's really typical of a bacterial disease because bacteria are very limited by veins and they just uh, produce those irregular lesions. Now, they're very, very small though sometimes, and so you gotta look really closely. Finally, uh, overall, when lesions start to expand on bacterial leaf streak, they look very yellow when you hold them up to the light. And that's not to say that we don't see a little yellow discoloration around gray leaf spot lesions, but not nearly as much. Well, let's look at pictures because that's more fun. And so on the left, we've got bacterial leaf streak and on the right, gray leaf spot, where you can see those rectangles that we talked about. And you can see how smooth the edges are, especially down here on the lower photo. Well, these are backlit too, and gosh, there's a little bit of yellow here around some of these lesions. But remember, that's the response of the plant to that pathogen. And there's not nearly as much yellow as what you see when you have a lot of bacterial leaf streak, especially down here on this, on this leaf. Now that one in particular, actually two of these were popcorn leaves. And there are some hybrids of popcorn that are very susceptible. Certainly not all of our hybrids though. We have dent corn that's susceptible and some that's looks quite resistant, but you have to keep those things in mind. And if you are a popcorn grower, I'd wanna make sh especially sure that you know how it's gonna react if you have this disease. Now over here, if you look really closely, this is really what I wanted to show you. Those lesions of bacterial leaf streak, they look kind of wavy and irregular. And you can see that especially too on the lower photo as well. So hopefully those tips will help you identify it. But you know what else, folks? If you have any doubt at all, you've got a lot of resources available to you right here in town on campus. We've got the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. And so that's, that's our job is to provide that service for a fee. And so for as little as $15, you can find out very quickly which one you have. So the big question, though, is how am I going to manage this disease if I have it? And we have, we're beginning to get a little bit more information on how better to do that. But initially we were making general recommendations for how we would recommend to manage any other bacterial disease. Because this bacterium, it behaves in some ways similar to Goss's wilt, but not in others. For example, it does overwinter in infected residue. And so that means if you've got it in any of your fields, you see it in any of your neighbor fields, it's likely to be there again year after year. So that's bad news. But we, uh, we know that the conditions that favor this disease are different too. While it needs that wet weather, it doesn't necessarily need a wound to get into the plant. I think this is bad news because often we see it develop in fields that never saw a hail event, never saw any other severe weather or high winds this bacteria gets into the natural openings in the leaves, you know, the stomata, that's where gas exchange occurs. And that's on both the top surface and the bottom surface. And so it's a lot easier um, to have infection develop. We don't have to beat these plants up at all when we're trying to work with it. It's a, it's a little bit scary. Well, you know, fungicides can't control this bacterium. And we get a lot of questions about what about bactericides? You know, in specialty crops in particular, we use a lot of bactericides, especially products that have copper, because they do have antifungal and antibacterial activity, but they have some really uh, practical limitations too, because these products, these bactericides, don't behave the same as what you and I are used to with fungicides. Our fungicides largely that we use on corn are systemic. They are absorbed, they move around, they have some systemicity, and they have residual protection that they can provide. Well, in contrast, bactericides are contact products, so they stay on the surface of the leaf. They're not absorbed in the plant, so they can be washed off with rain or irrigation. And that means in those other higher value crops, they're reapplying that frequently to control the disease that they're trying to work with. And so, 
this alone is probably going to make these bactericides impractical. My other bigger uh, concern is that when we spray these, that we're probably not going to get good coverage on both the top and bottom surface. Because remember, we've got those stomata where the bacteria get in on both top and bottom, and the bacteria are on both surfaces of the leaf too. And so that's why we haven't been recommending using bactericides, plus they can be pretty expensive too. Often not as expensive as a fungicide, but still in uh, the current economic environment and the low commodity prices, I don't think this is where we're gonna get the biggest bang for our buck. So any questions up to this point? I know I kind of flew through some of these slides and some of you may not have seen that before. I'm glad you asked that. I'm going to pay you to ask that here in about five or six slides. We, we're starting to work on that. Um, in general, it mainly appears to overwinter in the residue. But there is some, in, I guess, survival in the soil. We don't yet know how long, but we're beginning to work on that with some of our colleagues in multiple states. So stay tuned. So... Uh, a graduate student of mine, Tara Hartman, from uh, near, uh, I almost forgot, near Duncan. Douglas, I'm sorry, Dun where is Duncan? Duncan's up near Columbus, and she's near Douglas, and so she's worked with Leo for a few years. Tara's working on her master's degree, working on a project sponsored by the Nebraska Corn Board. And we got a big jump on trying to learn where this bacterium is and where the disease is developing in Nebraska. And so from part of this survey, you can see where the highlighted counties are in red. We now know it's in at least 60 Nebraska counties. So about two thirds of our counties we know have this disease. Now many of you have seen different versions of this map and it does keep changing as we learn more and more about it. And so, the biggest swath has, of course, always been through this southwest up through the northeast in the middle of the state. We've just begun to confirm a couple counties that are new, maybe over here in extreme eastern Nebraska. We've also added one out in the panhandle, too, and that was the first time we've been able to show that. And Odo County. Do we have a, did, did you send in a sample? Oh, maybe I need to get a sample from you then. Because selfishly, you, you need to know what we do too. We keep the bacteria and we use them for genetic studies too. And so I'd love to have representation from all over the state. And we, like you can see, we don't have good representation from that part of the state. So I'd love to talk to you later if you're starting to see that. And so good, thank you for letting me know. And so, you know, we're not trying to color the map in, but where the disease is, we definitely want to confirm it and let people know. This one drives me crazy up here. Um, I, there may only be two, two cornfields in Loop County, but I'm going to find it out there eventually because you know it's got to be there. And so uh, uh, here's another picture. Uh, so this is worst case scenario to me. This is one of those very, very susceptible popcorn hybrids. And this is kind of mid to late August. And we ended up with about 50% leaf area covered. And in that case, I know there was significant yield impact. Most people are reporting that they're not getting what they think is a, is a big yield impact, especially in dent corn. But certainly in some fields where we have more sensitive hybrid, I think that is, that is happening. Our research this year trying to focus and figure out what the yield impact is, we didn't get enough disease in those areas to, to really have a good number to share with you yet. So please stay tuned on that. We, uh, we would love to continue to get samples though. If you think you've got it, especially in the southeast part of the state, those samples are important to us because we want to let everybody know what's down there. And so uh, please let us know if you have questions. And you also see some counties from other states because we do have people that we work with and send us samples from outside the state. And uh, that definitely does not represent what they know is in their state. My counterparts in those states have a much better idea of how widespread it is. We know that probably about 20 to 25 counties in Kansas have been confirmed. And at least I think about a dozen counties in Iowa at this point. So we've, uh, we've certainly got some bacterial leaf streak a little bit of it almost everywhere, but this map doesn't tell you how, how uh, 
severe or what the incidence is. For example, in southwest Nebraska and south central Nebraska, the disease is very common. You'd find it in almost every field. But over here in some areas, like what we're talking about, not nearly as common. And so then you start to try to think about and draw some conclusions from this map. And so I would caution you on doing that. Uh, you might say, well, that's where all the overhead pivot irrigation is, right? And most of it's concentrated in that center part. And that probably does favor disease and, and help the bacteria move a little bit more. But we don't have data to back that up. That's probably the case. But for sure, uh, those acres are also probably uh, getting more attention from our crop consultants too. So there's a lot of uh, reasons that we might see this pattern. So let's keep going. So I told you earlier too that a little work had been done on this pathogen and the, uh, the host range and some of those tropical plants. Well, that's something that we have an interest in too. And so Tara has also been working on screening various species of plants because we want to know what Nebraska weeds or native plants or crops might also be sensitive. And so some of this information is, is hot off the press from just in the last few weeks. So you have two columns though. Let me explain what this means. Since we're in the midst of some of this work, uh, we're calling it, some were symptomatic. That means some developed lesions, like what we have in the picture here. Over here in this column, though, it means it did not develop lesions. But we can't quite rule out the possibility that it's susceptible yet because it's common for bacterial diseases to infect and not actually cause disease, but they can actually be inside the plant and reproduce. Well, that would be important if that happens because then those plants might be a reservoir for the pathogen and might lead to outbreaks of disease later on. So I can't quite rule them out yet, but the ones in the right-hand column did not develop lesions yet. Right now, there are hundreds of pots in our greenhouse, and this is what Tara is working on just this week, okay? And so the next time I talk to you, I'll probably rule out many of these plants the good news is, though, is that the initial tests look promising. For example, cereal rye. We were very concerned. We wanted to know that if that common cover crop is susceptible. Right now, it doesn't look like it, but we have one more step to do. Winter wheat, uh, we don't think that one is susceptible, and others. But we have something alarming here. We knew pretty quickly that oats were susceptible, and so we were specifically working with Jerry oats, and it's not that we grow a lot of oats here, we have some, but oats are part of some of our cover crop blends, and this might be important for us to understand. But at this point, it's unclear how important some of these are gonna be for disease outbreaks later on. This is more academic right now and helps point us in the right direction. Now, having rice on that list probably doesn't cause anybody any shivers in here, but there's a, there's a lot of concern in other states about what could happen. Arkansas in particular is our number one rice grower in the country. And we're working with their pathologist and we screened about five of their most common varieties and hybrids that they use in Arkansas and found pretty substantial disease on all of those. And so this could be important in other parts of the country. Now it hasn't been confirmed in Arkansas yet, but it is in three of their neighboring states. And so there's a good chance it could develop down there. In addition, we also looked at several weeds, or I should say Tara did, because, you know, I, I don't do the work. I just get to share the results with people like you, and so I, I have to credit my lab that all works together. Well, here's the better news on the right-hand side. Uh, these weeds are, apparently are not going to develop disease. They may harbor the bacteria we're waiting to see, but bristly foxtail, green foxtail, and yellow nutsedge, all were susceptible in the greenhouse test. Now there's a couple surprises here. One, yellow nutsedge, is that a shock? Why is that a surprise? Don't answer, Leo. <laughs> See, nutsedge is not a grass. This is in a whole different plant family. And so that tells us that there may be some more diversity out here that we don't understand yet and that we need to look beyond the grasses. 
And so Tara, Tara got pretty excited about this, not, not necessarily in a fun way, but she went out and got uh, seed from Palmer Amaranth and she wanted to test that. And I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not susceptible, but we tried. Um, but right now, that's something good to know. And not that yellow nut sedge is a very common disease like in our cornfields, but it is in our lawns and it's in some of the wetter areas like up near where I live in the edge of the sand hills. We've got a, a few patches of it up there too. Green foxtail, of course, we've got that. But then we have bristly foxtail, and you see it's starred. And so I am, um, I have less, I guess, concern about greenhouse test results because we can make a lot of things happen in the greenhouse that may not ever occur out in the real world. But what we did to make this a more practical uh, and useful bit of information is any plant species that showed up in the left-hand column as susceptible. We also planted in a second trial outside in our field plots at the South Central Ag Lab in Clay Center, taking this one step further. And bristly foxtail is one of two species that did develop disease out in the field. And so that could be more important to us knowing that weed is susceptible. And so uh, that's that's not all that uncommon. A lot of our weeds are susceptible to things like Goss's wilt and a few other things, but that's going to be something that we need to watch. Now, moving forward, I think some of this might be more alarming than any of it. And so here's where we start to look at some of our, our turf grasses and our native perennial prairie grasses. And so uh, you see a lot of pretty good news over here, a lot of things that we have out in our hay meadows. Don't initially looks susceptible. But it's what's in this column over here that I'm more concerned about because our top three prairie grasses made the list. And again, that's the greenhouse test. And so big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, and then we've got also orchard grass and timothy. But you see the, you see the stars on that one. Big blue stem developed disease out in the cornfield too when we planted it out there. And so, you know, it, it wasn't wiped out by any means and there were, all the plants didn't develop it, but the fact that it did develop it to some extent is concerning. And we, we haven't done any surveys in our CRP. No one's been out in the hay meadows and looking for any, any of this, but knowing that it has the potential to get disease could be something that we need to know. And thinking about how we handle some of this, because remember I told you the bacteria survive in infected corn residue. There's no reason it wouldn't also survive probably in some of these other plants if they became infected. And so how much of, how much of our meadows and grasslands are we bailing up and moving around? And so that's potential risk there, but we have a lot left to learn about what this really means to us practically. So any questions about this? Did, did you see uh, or not see a plant on here that maybe uh, we need to test or maybe we left off? Uh, in the current greenhouse testing, I'll tell you, we've added uh, cattail and some other things in there too to evaluate those, but we're always eager to add to our list if you didn't see something. Leo. Have you looked at Phragmites? Oh, I don't know if she's seen Phragmites or not. I'm sure we can get seed or is that something we need to grow uh, vegetatively? and go dig some up <laughs> and see I have to be careful with that too because with the widespread distribution of this disease I don't want to accidentally grab something that may already be infected too so maybe we can talk later about how we can get Phragmites uh, and, and test it that's a good idea I, I don't know if she may have and just haven't got it up here yes sir Well, we don't know yet, and I don't know that she's tested any woody plants. Right now, we've primarily focused on grasses, and it looks like grass-like organisms like the nutsedge. Uh, we certainly probably should look at something. I'll tell you something else she's looking at in this round of testing is some of our ornamental grasses, as well as uh, daylilies. You know those, uh, I know a lot of people call those corn lilies. You see all those uh, things that used to be on all the homesteads, those orange lilies. We're gonna look at some of those too because they're in a lot of our ditches and whatnot. And as far as woody plants go, I'm not sure. Do you got any ideas that you think we ought to start testing first? Or, you know, cause there's so many things out there, you know, and we won't be able to test everything, but, and getting a hold of some of the material might be hard too. Mm -hmm. 
But I mean, what are palm trees classified as? They're a monocot. They're not exactly a grass, but you remember uh, we have other levels of classification. So a monocot is where all of the grasses and all of the lilies and all the palm trees all fall under that because they have one single leaf in the beginning out of the seed. And so they're actually, palm trees are actually closer related to the grasses than they are to like our pine and oak trees. And so uh, I, did, I wasn't all that surprised, I guess, seeing palm trees on there. But uh, I guess we, uh, we have a lot left to learn yet though. All right, well, shall we? So there's some other things that we've been doing that I wanted to share with you too. And one of those was we began to work with a colleague from Iowa State University who is actually, uh, she runs the plant introduction station there where they have a collection of germplasm. And she approached us about screening some of that material and working with us on that. Well, they have thousands of lines and we can't possibly handle the volume that she's got. So we uh, worked with them to try to strategically select about, about 100 of them that we could look at. And we planted them out in our field plots out at Clay Center, where we actually have developed a nursery to work on this disease. And we can inoculate because there's so much disease already out there. And so planting those out there, inoculating them, and then rated them, it says at three times. I think some of them were rated more than that. But here's what it looked like. And so I know you can't read what's on the bottom. Those are the germplasm lines. You're not going to recognize most of them anyway. These are not commercially available hybrids. These are ones from historical. Hey, help me out here, Tom. How would I explain this? This is more in your line of work. Yeah, there are some of the lines up there that are historically important um, that, are, that were used in developing a germplasm that's currently commercially available. The most of that material up there is from samples of this project that I was telling you about, the cooperative between public, private, and USDA uh, sources. And so it's samples of the worldwide drone project. Thank you. You're better at that than I am. But, you know, I think the point, though, is, too, that we're just barely scratching the surface. This was just a stab in the dark to see what we might find. And... I am very encouraged by what we found. Let me show you what you're looking at here. And so you see a lot of bars of varying heights that we've sorted according to high and low. And so what we found was that some of these lines got a lot of disease and some of them had very little disease on this end. That alone is very exciting to me. And I was mentioning this to Tom in the last few days. And so it shows a diversity in reactions out there, and we potentially might have resistance already in our backgrounds. And so this is uh, really exciting for us, but uh, there's a couple things I wanna share with you too. And so when Candace Gardner uh, and I were working on selecting some of these, you know, we don't know, is this really resistant down here? Is this really susceptible up here? You know, we need to do some more work on that because we don't have check lines right now to compare with that we know for sure. But one of the criteria that we used to select these lines was looking at the, the flowering, uh, what would be the right word, Tom? The flowering group? Yeah. Flowering date, say what flowering date. they are because some of these are going to be tropical <laughs> Clear to temperature. And so there's a lot of diversity reflected in, in this small group. And in fact, they break out into four specific groups uh, based on those flowering dates, right? So that's not the same as relative maturity, like we're maybe more used to talking about. But in every one of those groups, we had that same uh, diversity out there. And so we might be scratching the surface of finding resistance out there. And so, uh, again, you may not recognize most of these, but I did circle a couple that I think you're going to be familiar with. And so anybody remember Mo17 and B73? That's what those two are down there. And they're on the good end of the, of the graph with the less disease. And so I, I don't know how important they are in some of our contemporary commercially available hybrids, but isn't that exciting? I mean, we, we should be very pleased about that, I think. And um, there's a lot of promise here, I think, that we need to look at. Yes, sir. When you mentioned the 
<laughs> the bacterial leaf streak. You know, I don't think it's. I don't think there was any relationship there, but uh, <laughs> that's a little out of my wheelhouse, though. We had it happen to us too, but that's. Uh, I think that's going to be a whole separate issue. Well, good. Thank you. So we're we're pretty excited about where this uh, what this looks like, and so that's just a summary of what we what we did again. Well, we did the same thing with popcorn too, because we know that there's some very susceptible popcorn lines out there, and so we worked with a few popcorn companies and got 10 different hybrids and they asked us not to share those just yet until we know more about them. But we had a similar reaction and so I display the data a little bit differently because when you look at only 10 of them, you can kind of look at what disease did over time. And so on the left hand side of the graph, that's in mid-July and then over here to mid-August. And just in that four week time period, you can see disease really take off, especially <laughs> And some of these these hybrids up here, those are our commercially available, more susceptible hybrids. But some of those hybrids did very, very well. And so uh, we're confident that some of those are going to look really good. And they looked really good in the field. And in fact, just right next to each other, 30 inches away, being about a third covered in some of the leaves with bacterial leaf streak to having zero lesions on them. And so there's big differences out there. So. And when you uh, melt it all down into one number, it looks very much like the initial graph that I showed you of the dent corn. Okay. All right. And so we've got a number of other different studies too. And so one of them is our mitigation study. This one was funded by the USDA APHIS Farm Bill. And so we have, I don't know if you can see the state there, but I think Nebraska went away, but... It's the, I think the bulb's a little light. Is that so, what's going on? Yeah, okay. Light's on the screen over here on my right. Okay, good. So you know where. So this is nor uh, North Platte out here. Uh, and North Platte, this is up in the northeast. That's the Concord Haskell Ag Lab station. And this is the UNL SCAL, South Central Ag Lab near Clay Center right there. So just to give you an idea of uh, where we're talking about here. This study was meant to look at what some of our current practices are and how they might impact this disease. And so in particular, we were interested in tillage practices and crop rotation sequences. And so we have three locations here. Initially, we proposed six, and then the budget got cut back in the farm bill. We actually got cut back 60%, and so we lost a lot of that, had to trim a lot down. And so uh, now we're only working with corn and soybean rotations, which is better for you guys here locally. But uh, and then conventional till, no till and strip tillage to see what impact that has on disease the following year in corn. Now, I have very little data here because this was the first year. And in fact, we didn't know the project was moving forward until about March. And so some of these treatments were not done until two weeks before planting. And so I don't think they show you the full impact of what you might see. In general, though, I'll show you that in these three graphs representing those three locations. So we've got, this is the Clay Center location, North Platte, and up northeast at the Concord uh, location. And they all just represent disease development over time. In all of them, they had pretty low disease severity in 2017. In general, I think that was probably the case in many spots around the state where we had less disease. Uh, surprisingly, the most disease we had was in the Northeast this past year in uh, the Haskell Ag Lab. And what I wanna show you is when you see all of these letters piled up on top of each other and I don't think it's necessarily important for you to know uh, these are all the, the tillage treatments that we're looking at. What was interesting, at least in this first year of data, is that early on in the ratings, and uh, it looks like that was down about V5, V6, early on during the season when we were collecting ratings, there were differences with some of those tillage treatments. And, you know, it's not necessarily surprising that we would expect tillage to promote degradation of infected residue so that we have less disease the following year. But I think the take home here is that it didn't matter by the end of the season because by the end of the season, the same amount of disease was across the entire plot area. 
regardless of what tillage treatment was out there or the crop rotation. And so I don't necessarily want you to think this is the final results. This is just the first year. And after the next couple of years, we should have better results and have a stronger feeling about how well that might work. At, you know, at this point, um, I have less confidence that uh, either crop rotation or tillage is going to be the way that we need to manage this. And they're impractical for many of you anyway, right? So just know we're doing it and we'll have more information later. We're also working with our colleagues at other institutions and uh, especially over at Colorado State with uh, one of my counterparts, Kirk Broders, and he's been involved in this from nearly the beginning and now also a geneticist over at the University of Illinois as well. And so there's just so many things everybody's looking at. I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what else is going on out there that we're involved with. And so if you look at where this bacterium is located on corn, uh, Kirk didn't include, these are his slides, but he didn't include where it's located on sugarcane. But certainly we've confirmed it in all of these states you see highlighted, plus uh, uh, Illinois didn't get highlighted in his map here. So we know it's in, in the Midwest and the Great Plains. We knew earlier that it was in South Africa, and now we know it's in Argentina. And so one of the biggest questions is, well, where did our bacteria come from? And so uh, do you think it came from South Africa up, since we've known about that one longer? Did that bacteria somehow go to Argentina and then up? Uh, and so that's one of the areas that Kirk, Kirk is looking at. And so that's where your bacteria come into this. And so we take the bacteria from the infected samples that we receive from all over the state and we share those with Kirk because his specialty is more in molecular biology and doing some of the very, very complex DNA analyses that our lab doesn't do. And so that's, that's why we collaborate, right? And so in his analyses, and the output is quite complex. And so it spits out what we call phylogenetic trees that look very, very strange. And you see a lot of weird lines and you see a lot of, a lot of little words. And in fact, on this picture right now, hopefully in your printout, you can see a little more color than I can see up here on the, on the uh, screen. Yes, you can. I'm glad to see that. Thank you. And so when you look, maybe look at the paper instead of the screen. You'll see some boxes in blue, some boxes in green, and maybe some pink on there too. Well, those, uh, those green boxes on there are um, ones that are showing you where the Nebraska bacteria are and how they clump together. And so what that means was when you see all of these Nebraska isolates clumping together, it means they were all very similar to each other not much diversity there. And so that's across their entire genome. And so what that tells us is that our bacterium causing our disease in the United States was probably a more recent introduction, okay? In contrast though, if you compare that to what you see from what he has from Argentina, and so uh, Argentina isolates, some of them are up here in a box that's, I think those boxes, are they blue? up there at the top of that, yes. And so you've got some Argentina isolates up here. You've got some of them over here on this other branch. You've got some somewhere else over here. I think that I can't even read that, but they're, they're scattered all over the place. The practical way of explaining that is those isolates are a lot more diverse than what ours are. And so the conclusion, the preliminary conclusion is that it's probably more likely that our bacteria came from Argentina and so uh, there are some on there from South Africa, but unfortunately he can only get about three isolates from there. And that's really not enough to, of a sample size to get a good idea what's going on. But those three clumped in one little box down here below Argentina. And so practically speaking right now, they're kind of thinking that ours may have come from Argentina for whatever that's worth because of what we've got. And so that's some of the work that he's doing and we're, uh, some of those results are. But together, we're all looking at some other things too, like coming back to your earlier question about survival of the bacteria. And so Kurt started a year before we did, and this is basically trying to take advantage of some of the characteristics of the disease cycle that we're learning. And so 
we, we know it overwinters in the residue. We don't know how well it does or how much that tillage is going to affect it. All these pieces are going to hopefully come together and tell a better story. But in this overwintering study, one of the things we did is we have samples that we stake down on the surface of, uh, of the soil to represent what you might see in a no-till situation. We also have a bag buried underneath that, about six or eight inches to represent what you might see with tillage. And all these bags are filled with leaves that have bacterial leaf streak, okay, that were collected at the end of the season. And so some of his initial work from one year of work at three locations show us that as you might expect, there was a lot more bacteria in the leaves that were maintained on the surface. So that's what the blue bars are. In contrast, anything that was buried uh, to kind of simulate uh, tillage, those are the red bars. And so there was about 100 times more bacteria that survived in the leaves on the surface versus what got buried in simulated tillage. In contrast, too, when you look at what he got out of the soil, it was much less, uh, very, a pretty low number. Keep in mind, this is a, this is a log scale, and CFUs per pound, that just means uh, it's a measure of how we uh, calculate bacteria, colony forming units. So just know that bigger bar means more bacteria, okay? And that's a logarithmic scale, so uh, that's not double here, that is 100 times different. So. So what we've done now is we've also added, we added five locations in various parts of Nebraska to represent all of our different environments. That's going on right now. And we also have our colleague at Iowa that simulated that in two or three locations over there. And he's repeating his locations in Colorado as well. So we don't have results from this. We'll dig these up and haul them in in April and then he'll test those for us. So maybe seen on the leaf. Um, you, you and I can't see it. You might see evidence of it on a, on a green living leaf. Uh, so we had a question about, can we see this? You might see a little yellow shiny uh, material that's bacterial exudate. They, they get pushed out on the surface when there's a lot of them. But uh, in general, that's, you, that's not a good enough way to be able to identify it. You have to actually go in and cut these leaves up and get the bacteria out. And then you do some other things on Petri dishes. You've seen all seen those Petri dishes. That's what happens here. And then using some molecular work, too, to confirm which one we have. So there, it's actually a great deal of work to do something like this and handle all of these leaves when they do come up. So. What you probably can't see is that's a mesh bag. It's filled with holes. And so I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> it looks like a trash bag, doesn't it? It's not. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. I assume that we all know, but these are mesh bags. They're water permeable. They have very small holes, but they're also uh, a pretty rigid uh, fabric so that uh, they won't get, you know, these are... These are in a pretty harsh environment out there. That, in fact, this is this is in one of our fields just north of my house, and I know it got 13 inches of snow on it the other day, and a whole lot of wind there for a few hours. And so they have to be a pretty rigid material, but they're very uh, perforated. They're very holy, so water does get through there. Bacteria would get in there. Uh, we don't know yet about animals, so that's uh, always a risk. So. Uh, yeah, hopefully that makes better sense now. Thank you for asking that. I didn't think to say that. Yeah, they're not trash bags. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a lot of other research going on. I summarized that in another slide if you want to see some of that. If you have observations, things that you've seen out there or other questions and ideas, please let me know because they give us ideas for other things that maybe we should pursue to better answer some of your questions. But that's just a summary of some of the things going on in our lab and folks that we're collaborating with too. So, well, if you have questions about bacterial leaf streak or any other disease or fungicide use, we have a lot of resources available to you on the CropWatch website. And so you've got the website here. We also have a lot of videos, not only for uh, diagnostic purposes, but you see frequently on Market Journal, we talk about some of the current issues going on. And if any of you are into, are into Twitter or any other social media, we've got uh, 
we've got a lot of activity going on there, sharing information. So, and you've always got folks like Tyler at your county extension office that can share information with you or help you get in touch with me if you have any questions. So thank you guys so much for letting me come out today and talk to you. And what, what questions do you have or observations or concerns that? What do you do about it? What do you do about it? Yeah. So, you know, management. You know, I would still recommend crop rotation if you've got the disease, because in general, that's more likely to help than to hurt. Um, the other thing, though, is I don't know that I'd recommend tillage, because many of you aren't using tillage for some of the other more important reasons. And I'm not convinced it's that effective anyway, based on what we're seeing in some of our initial data. Uh, so I would work with my seed agronomist. We may not have the uh, ratings for those hybrids in all the catalogs yet, but a lot of those seed companies have a general idea of which ones may perform better than others. And if you can better position, you know, some of what, like Tom said, better position the hybrid for the situation, you'd be further ahead. In general, my feeling is that crop resistance is going to be the most effective way to manage this disease, like it is many of our other bacterial diseases, but it won't be immediate. While we may have identified some potential resistance back in the background, it could be years before we have commercially available hybrids, right? And so we have to be patient on some of that. Goss's wilt, that's the best way to control Goss's wilt is with resistant hybrids right now because I don't recommend spraying anything for it. Yes? What kind of yield losses? And so, uh, when it comes to yield loss, that's still uh, something that we don't have a good number on. We initiated a project and had that in 2017. And honestly, I, I don't feel like it was successful because we didn't have enough disease to really know. And so that's another practical problem of us working with disease because that project didn't get enough out there. And so we don't have good data from that. So we're going to have to repeat that again. So at this point, all I have are anecdotal evidence of what some of our producers have shared with us. And uh, like, like I said earlier, many of them thought this was uh, having a minimal, little to no effect on yield. It's really going to matter how much leaf area is affected, just like with gray leaf spot. And so, uh, and of course, that's, a lot of that's determined by the environment, how conducive the weather was. And in 2017, it just wasn't as favorable as it was in 16 and 15. And so the, uh, the short answer is if you got a lot of affected leaf area, like some of those popcorn lines, they had big impact. In that particular field, I know it was a couple miles from my house and I saw it weekly. Uh, they probably lost, well, they look at pounds instead of bushels. They lost about a thousand pounds per acre. And what's that, about 20? percent of what they should have made. And I know that was the only disease out there. There may have been other uh, challenges, but we don't have good numbers. That's not typical. That was worst case scenario, probably some of the worst I had seen. And all of these hybrids are going to react different, right, right, Tom? So we have, a, we have a lot of work to do, but I think that's the more promising area. Yes, Leo. I have a question coming from some producers. If I am removing the fed through cattle, mm -hmm. there was leaves in there, and we had it on the fed survive, the rumen, the cattle, the spread back on them, out on the field of the room. The other thing was, is, there, is it on the seed, the bacteria? Oh, that's a good the question. Or the seed companies take, well, they don't have the bacterial side of it. Mm -hmm. But is it, can it be moved by the seed? Those are great questions. Let's talk about that in reverse order. So the last question asked was about, or can, can we move this on seed? And so that's one of the projects we've been working with Iowa State, Colorado State, and uh, well, that's, that's it then. So we've been collecting ears and grain from around the state from fields where we documented a lot of disease. And the great news, which I, I rarely have really good news, but the good news so far is that they have very little evidence of little to no bacteria on or in the seed. And that's at the Iowa State Seed Laboratory. And so they found a little bit on the outside, but it's unclear whether that was just hitchhiking along because of the way that we combine. And think about all that residue covered in bacteria. It could have just been a contaminant. And so they have not really found anything inside the seed. And 
that was something that USDA APHIS very quickly wanted to pursue because they wanted to know if that had a potential impact on our export market. And right now, there's little to no concern about that. So that's really good news. We can't explain how it got here at this point. Uh, you know, even Goss's wilt can be moved to some extent in seed, but it's very, very infrequent. 0.01 to 0.04 percent. It's very small. And so it may turn out that we have some numbers like that, but it, we're, we're still too early in that process. So that's reasonably good news at this point. We're early in the trial, though. The second part of that was about uh, bailing up the stover and feeding that for cattle. And so we don't have data on that. But I would say it would probably depend on the temperature that we get in, in the gut and how long it's in there exposed to that temperature. Um, and there was a preliminary study, and I don't think they didn't take it and get it published on Goss's wilt, the bacteria. They knew that some of the bacteria might survive in the manure. We don't know that about this bacterium. I, I think that I'd be more concerned about what didn't get consumed, and so what dropped down in the bedding might get scooped up and spread on another field. And so we know it clearly survives well in the residue. And so we don't know about what mortality it might have in the cow. That sounds like a dirty job. That'd probably make Mike Rose show. <laughs> that sounds like animal, an animal science project. Nobody. Well, they don't anyway. They think we're typhoid tamra or something. I don't know. <laughs> Good questions. Anybody else? Well, if you think you've seen it, we'd sure like to get a sample from you, and we welcome questions any time of the year, not just at these meetings. So thanks so much for your help and coming out today. And to